Hello, this is Gina Piscatelli with a lecture for Anatomy and Physiology 2 on the female reproductive system. In this lecture, I'll focus on the ovaries and the formation of gametes, known as gametogenesis. Before I start looking at the function of the ovaries, let's look at the anatomy. The outer portion of the ovary is referred to as the ovarian cortex, and this is the location of developing gametes. You can see different structures in this picture that are circular. Some of them are white, some of them are blue, and some of them are red. These structures are actually developing follicles that have developing gametes inside of them. And we'll talk about why they vary in structure. Um, there's some really big ones and little ones and different colors as we go on, okay, throughout this lecture. The center of the ovary is referred to as the ovarian medulla, and this is the location of large blood vessels and nerves. The outer covering of the ovary is um, composed of connective tissue called the tunica albiginia, just like in the testicle. I think it's interesting to note that the medulla has um, neural input, or that the ovary does, because it's pretty well understood um, that the ovary is controlled hormonally, um, the developing gametes occur in a sequence of events, occurs in a sequence of events based on uh, anterior pituitary hormones. But there's also substantial evidence that suggests the autonomic nervous system contributes to ovarian function or physiology. We won't be studying those nerves, but it's just interesting to note that there are quite a few ways that the ovary is controlled. So the functions of the ovaries include the formation of gametes or gametogenesis, and then the ovulation of gametes. Ovulation just means the release of the gamete from the ovary into the peritoneal cavity or the abdominal pelvic cavity. And then the gametes need to be moved into the uterus for both fertilization as well as implantation of an uh, embryo. Another function of the ovary or ovaries is to produce hormones. The ovarian hormones are estrogen and progesterone. And the cells in the ovaries that secrete these hormones are called follicle cells although there's specific types of cells that secrete estrogen and specific types that secrete progesterone. The last function of the ovaries is to control the uterine menstrual cycle. The main purpose is to prepare the uterus for pregnancy, but there's a sequence of events um, that occur when pregnancy does not um, happen or fertilization doesn't happen, so pregnancy is not needed. So before we look at those four functions individually, uh, let's just look at an overview of ovarian, functional, of ovarian function. And um, I'd like to note that ovarian function is cyclical. And so we often refer to physiology of the ovary as the ovarian cycle. This phrase, when you see it, refers to the fact that the ovary produces gametes and hormones in a cyclical pattern. This pattern repeats approximately every 28 days. The release of a gamete, known as ovulation, occurs at the midpoint of the cycle. So it's shown here in this graph at day 14, an oocyte is being released from a group of cells called a follicle. This oocyte will then 
leave the ovary entirely and go out into the abdominal pelvic cavity. So that's the midpoint. The two phases on either side of that midpoint are called the follicular phase and the luteal phase. And if you look at the picture, it sort of makes sense why they are named this way. In the follicular phase, you can see all of these structures. These are follicles that each contain an individual oocyte or developing gamete. These follicles change during the follicular phase. Some become much larger to the point where we end up with one individual follicle that's dominant. So this is all about proliferation and formation and changing the follicles. That's what the follicular phase is all about. The phase on the other side of ovulation called the luteal phase is predominated by the formation of a structure called the corpus luteum, which is this yellow structure. And this is what the follicle turns into after the gamete has been released. So as we proceed through this lecture, we'll be looking at what happens in both the follicular phase and the luteal phase. The main events that occur during the follicular phase are gametogenesis and estrogen secretion. And the main events that occur in the luteal phase are formation of that corpus luteum that I showed you, as well as the secretion of progesterone. Both of these phases control the changes that we see in the uterus during what's known as the uterine cycle or the menstrual cycle. So ovarian hormones, estrogen and progesterone, are going to control the uterus, at least the lining of the uterus. We'll start here with the function of the ovary known as gametogenesis. It involves actually two processes. So formation of a gamete involves two processes. One is oogenesis. We've studied this already in our lab. Oogenesis involves the maturation of an oocyte from a stem cell by the process of meiosis, a cell division process, where a diploid cell produces haploid products. The other process that's involved in forming a gamete is known as folliculogenesis. Folliculogenesis is development of a follicle. And this follicle is made up of several cells that surround an oocyte. So in the picture on the left, you can see in the cortex that there are several follicle structures. We just call them follicles for now. They do have individual names, but for now they're just follicles. They're all at different stages of folliculogenesis. Within the follicle is a, a developing oocyte. So oogenesis, which will be somewhat familiar to you, begins with primordial germline cells or primordial stem cells. These, um, the maturation of these is stimulated by a hormone called luteinizing hormone. And that's an anterior pituitary hormone. And I'll just abbreviate it LH here. Folliculogenesis is stimulated by a different anterior pituitary hormone called follicle stimulating hormone or FSH. You've heard of both of these in relation to testis function, and now we're seeing that they also influence ovarian function. 
Follicles are really important for both oogenesis and folliculogenesis, and I hope by the end of this explanation you'll understand why. It's mainly because follicles are really the functional units of the ovary, specifically the ovary making gametes. What they do is they provide an ideal environment for oocyte maturation. And so every month, a number of follicles are recruited by hormones to grow and then create this ideal environment so that the oocyte can develop, go through meiosis, and eventually the follicle needs to release a mature oocyte. And we know in females that the oocyte isn't going to complete its entire meiosis or meiotic divisions until it's been released. So the follicles actually need to develop and grow, release the oocyte, and then we can finish the oogenesis part. So in this picture, you see the cortex of an ovary. It happens to be a cat ovary, but it would be the same for any mammal, humans included. And in the cortex, notice that there are various follicles. Um, they differ in size and structure. And this reflects the different stages of folliculogenesis, which is what I'd like to start with. So on the surface of the ovary, there are really small follicles. And the oocytes inside of them are quite small. We can't even make them out in this picture. But then notice there's this really large one, also circled in yellow. The developing oocyte is rather small compared to the whole follicle. And also in this particular follicle, there's a fluid filled cavity. And that's going to be very important in the process of releasing the gamete. So let's look um, in a little bit more depth at the different names that have been assigned to these different types of follicles and what stage they're at. So the first stage of folliculogenesis consists of a primordial follicle composed of multiple cells forming just one layer around the oocyte. In this diagram, the oocyte is yellow and the nucleus is blue. The surrounding follicle cells are pink and they're flat, so we call them squamous. But this is what a primordial follicle looks like. This is the first follicle to develop in the fetus. We start off with about 7 million of these primordial follicles each containing an oocyte, but throughout fetal development only about 2 million survive and so that's what's left at the time of birth. The other 5 million or so have undergone a process known as programmed cell death or atresia. So they um, basically degenerate or die and are absorbed. Now at the onset of puberty, most of these primordial follicles do not change or develop and many more undergo atresia. So not all of the two million will survive throughout our adulthood. Of those that do survive, some just stay, we never use them. They just stay in this primordial follicle stage. Others progress to the primary follicle stage and then they'll move on. Some will move on to secondary, secondary some will move on to antral, etc. Most agree that at the time of puberty, a woman has approximately 400,000 
primordial follicles, each with an oocyte. So 400,000 oocytes. And 90 to 95% of them, of all follicles in an adult, are these primordial follicles. So when people say things like, a woman is born with a lifetime supply of oocytes, that's what they mean. From puberty onward, until a, a woman reaches menopause, a group of about 20 of these primordial follicles will be recruited by a hormone each month to continue this process of folliculogenesis. So 20 or so will respond to cyclical hormonal levels. Those hormones are gonadotropins made in the anterior pituitary. But even then, if 20 are recruited each month, only one of them is going to be ovulated. So really only one oocyte will be in a follicle that reaches what we see here as the fifth phase, the antral follicle or tertiary follicle, which ruptures to release the mature oocyte. This is because the group of 20 that were recruited to continue from primary follicle onward, they sort of compete in a way in the sense that the one that has the best receptors for hormones will become the dominant follicle and it will be the one that takes over and matures all the way through, allowing its oocyte to do so as well. It takes about a year for a single primordial follicle to progress to the stage of ovulation. That's stage number five there. So let's look at these different stages and see what happens to a follicle uh, if it does make it to be the, become the dominant follicle. So from a primordial follicle containing one layer of squamous cells surrounding an oocyte, we go to a primary follicle. This again just has one layer of cells, but the cells are no longer squamous, they're cuboidal. From this stage, the follicle cells, the cuboidal follicle cells, will multiply by mitosis and form layers of cells. So now we can say the follicle is stratified because there's layers of cells. Now it's a secondary follicle. The stratified cuboidal cells that are closest to that yellow oocyte are called granulosa cells. The outer paler flat cells are called fecal cells. And notice that there's a clear zone between the yellow oocyte and the granulosa cells. This clear zone is called the zona pellucida. And so a secondary follicle not only is recognized by the fact that there's layers of cells, but also by the fact that there's this clear zona pellucida around the oocyte. From there, if it responds well to hormones, a secondary follicle will develop into what's called an antral follicle or a tertiary follicle. This happens because the granulosa cells are secreting fluid and the fluid coalesces kind of like hydrophilic interactions. So the fluid all aggregates in the middle to form a cavity. This cavity is called the antrum. So a, a tertiary or antral follicle is um, recognized by the presence of this antrum. Eventually, the fluid pressure in the antrum increases so much that the wall of the follicle ruptures, and that's the fifth phase. 
the rupture of the antral follicle. In this case, the oocyte is released because the follicle has burst, essentially. And the oocyte that's released is still surrounded by a layer or two of granulosa cells. Now, after that oocyte surrounded by granulosa cells is released, the remaining follicle cells, they actually turn into or transform into this structure called a corpus luteum. And the corpus luteum still has living cells in it, and those cells are going to produce ovarian hormones. And this corpus luteum will be maintained if pregnancy occurs. So it'll be maintained throughout pregnancy. But if it isn't, if pregnant, I'm sorry, if pregnancy doesn't occur and it's not maintained, it will eventually degenerate, become a scar, essentially, scar connective tissue, and that's called a corpus albicans. So let's look at the um, first three or four stages in just a little bit more detail so you can recognize what different types of cells in the follicle are doing. So there isn't a whole lot to say about the first stage. We have a primordial follicle of single layered cells surrounding the oocyte. I guess it's noteworthy to know, to mention that the uh, follicle cells are connected to the oocyte and they can pass nutrients to the oocyte, which is going to help the oocyte maturation or just viability. The primary follicle contains an oocyte that's a bit bigger. It has taken in some nutrients and it has grown, made more cell membrane, made more cytoplasm uh, and other uh, organelles. And then we reach the secondary follicle. The secondary follicle has an even larger oocyte. And now we have multiple layers of follicular cells. The granulosa cells are cuboidal shaped. And the fecal cells that the arrow is pointing to on the top here are on the outside. Note the presence of the zona pellucida. That's visible in this secondary follicle. So in the um, picture on the left, the histological picture, I think this, I think this came from cat too, but I can't remember where I got it. The primordial follicle is circled in yellow. And you can see that the oocyte is in the center. And there wasn't a very wonderful, great primary follicle in this particular field of view, but I circled one in red. You can see that there are cuboidal cells in the lower left part. Um, the slice of the ovary just captured that part of the primary follicle. But the follicle that's surrounded in green is clearly a secondary follicle because we have multiple layers of cells, cuboidal granulosa cells, and then outer thecal cells. The zona pellucida isn't maybe that apparent compared to the diagram, but it's still there. So what's important about these secondary follicles is that we're already going to see hormone production. It's the granulosa cells that make estrogen. So those cuboidal cells make estrogen. The other thing that those granulosa cells do is make glycoproteins and deposit those glycoproteins into the zona pellucida. That's going to become really important uh, later when 
when uh, a fertilization event occurs because it helps sperm bind to the oocyte. It also prevents multiple sperm from fertilizing the egg. You only want one sperm to do so. So it's the granulosa cells that make the estrogen and the outer thecal cells make hormones too, which really act more as paracrine signaling molecules to help development of the follicle and the oocyte. But we think of it as a hormone because it's an androgen like testosterone. And so we think of it traveling in the bloodstream. But in the secondary follicle, the androgens really act locally. The granulosa cells are going to convert the androgens into estrogen. And the estrogens themselves are going to help the follicle grow as well as the oocyte mature. Then we get to the tertiary stage or the antral stage. And now we've got six or seven layers of granulosa cells, maybe, I don't know how many actually, but certainly six or seven layers of follicular cells. And the granulosa cells continue to secrete more fluid and the fluid moves into the antrum. Now, there's a few um, granulosa cells that stay very close to the oocyte. So the antrum forms in the middle of all the granulosa cells. It makes a cavity in the middle of the layers of granulosa cells. Some granulosa cells stay around the oocyte. The ones that stay form this structure called the corona radiata. And those are the cells that will be ovulated with the oocyte. Now the oocyte and the corona radiata are still attached at this point to the outer part of the follicle. We'll call it the wall of the follicle on the periphery of the antrum. And the connection though is narrow. It's by a group of cells called the cumulus oophorus. I hope I said that right. And it's really important because it creates a barrier, both physical and chemical, between that developing oocyte and blood supply into the ovary. So it's almost like a blood egg barrier. Now the fecal cells that originally we saw as kind of just one layer they become, there's multiple layers, essentially two layers, and those differentiate. They start looking different each layer. One is called, one layer is called the theca interna, and one layer is called the theca externa. The theca interna secretes androgens, which is right close to the granulosa cells, which can turn those androgens into estrogen and keep it local. The theca external cells, they can contract and that helps increase pressure on the antrum and eventually facilitates the rupture of the wall of the follicle. And we'll come back to that. So um, this picture shows on the, the left, upper left, shows how an antral or tertiary follicle ruptures. This process, this rupturing process and releasing the oocyte is referred to as ovulation. And what happens to create ovulation is that the cumulus oophorus, that stalk that connected the corona radiata to the wall of the follicle, constricts. And so then the oocyte and the corona radiata are freely floating in the antrum. But then the outside, the thecal cells on the outside, 
constrict because there's some smooth muscle like cells that can constrict and that push, pushes a, the fluid against the wall of the follicle and the follicle bursts so when it bursts the wall of the follicle out comes the oocyte and the corona radiata after they have left we still have the wall of the follicle left and it collapses and there's usually some bleeding because there's been blood supply to this follicle and so you'll see some blood in the antrum region here which you can see that blood eventually clots and is absorbed by the local cells but the granulosa and theca interna cells start undergoing mitosis and those cells fill up the antrum and it becomes more of a solid mass of cells and that's when we call it the corpus luteum the reason that it looks yellow this corpus luteum here is because the theca interna cells that have multiplied and kind of taken over the space of the antrum accumulate lipid and that lipid is yellow evidently I don't know the Greek or Latin root for yellow is lute so those cells are often called lutean cells I don't know you don't have to worry about that but it's a corpus luteum now and it's accumulating lipid the cells of the corpus luteum secrete progesterone so this is the first we've heard of progesterone the second ovarian hormone the first one was estrogen estrogen was made by the granulosa cells the second hormone now is progesterone and it's made by the corpus luteum I do have a couple of movies to show you of ovulation one is a drawing um, kind of an animation a cartoon like thing the other is an actual movie of the surface of a rabbit ovary showing you ovulation so first I'm going to play the um, drawing or the cartoon of ovulation and what you're looking at here is a drawing of an ovary and it's showing you I don't know if it'll let me draw on it but I'm gonna try it's showing you right here kind of a secondary follicle it's possible it's a primary follicle I'm not sure it's just a drawing this drawing comes from a professor at the University of New South Wales in Australia so let me show you this movie here secondary tertiary rupture so that's kind of cool you can watch it at your leisure but the one that's really neat is the next one so it looks a little dark to me but I think you'll still see it again you're looking at the surface of an ovary and where you want to look is um, I'll draw on it for a second is right here this is where ovulation is going to occur there it goes that is the oocyte with a surrounding corona radiata that has been released from the ovary and you can tell on the surface of the ovary that this is a follicle that is definitely in the tertiary stage but evidently it wasn't the dominant follicle that month maybe it will rupture next month or whenever it responds the best to the hormones we usually have a group of follicles that can that are at various stages in the ovary okay so what happens to the corpus luteum 
Well, if pregnancy occurs, there's a hormone that keeps the corpus luteum intact and it keeps producing progesterone. So it's kind of like the uterus and the ovary are going to cooperate during this time. Uh, if pregnancy does not occur, then there's no hormone made to keep the corpus luteum alive and it basically degenerates into a scar-like structure called the corpus albicans. And I think albicans means white because the corpus albicans that you see in an actual ovary is, is white. It's scar-like tissue. It won't ever function again to form um, or release an oocyte. It's done. It's over. Well, you can see um, some interesting other structures in this uh, pretty fresh picture of an ovary. Here's another corpus albicans. Here's another one right here. But what I think is kind of cool up in the upper left where there's a dotted line, you can see a very large corpus luteum, but I can only see part of it. The lumen of the corpus luteum would be like right here. And you can see how yellow it really looks. So we've looked at how the follicle changes throughout the follicular phase and the luteal phase of the ovarian cycle. Just to summarize, in the cortex, we have many different follicle stages. Primordial, here's a tertiary. There's another tertiary, there's a lot of tertiaries. Uh, this probably is secondary and the one beneath it is probably primary. And most of the follicles in the adult ovary are at the primordial stage. Each month, a group of primordial follicles are recruited by an anterior pituitary hormone called follicle stimulating hormone and they will become primary follicles. The cells in the primary follicle will divide by mitosis to form a secondary follicle and that secondary follicle has layers of cells. Some of the cells nearest the oocyte are called granulosa cells and those that are farther away are called fecal cells. The granulosa cells are the ones that make estrogen and the estrogen is needed locally for the um, meiosis and oocyte maturation. The granulosa cells also make the fluid that creates the zona pellucida region and convert androgens to estrogen. Well, where did the androgens come from? Well, they're just local signaling molecules made by the fecal cells. Eventually, the granulosa cells secrete so much fluid that a cavity forms in the middle of their layers, uh, which isn't that different than how an embryo develops as well, but it's there's like this pump that pumps water into the middle. Anyway, um, that fluid filled cavity in an antral or tertiary follicle is called the antrum. So all of that is happening up until day 13 or so. And then on day 14, that tertiary follicle ruptures and an oocyte is released or ovulated. Then in the luteal phase, the follicle collapses and the corpus luteum forms and it's filled with clotted blood and yellow lipid. But there are cells in there, many, many, many cells because mitosis has happened with the remaining follicle cells and they make progesterone. That progesterone is going to help the uterus prepare for pregnancy. If pregnancy occurs, occurs, then the developing embryo and placenta make a hormone that keeps that corpus luteum alive. 
if there is no pregnancy or implantation and no placenta, then there won't be a hormone keeping the corpus luteum alive. And the corpus luteum will shrink and become a corpus albicans. So that's one half of gametogenesis. That's just development of the follicle and recruitment of this really dominant follicle that actually does the rupturing and releasing of the oocyte. But what about the oocyte itself? What stage is it in when it's ovulated? We studied this a little bit in lab, so it's going to be somewhat familiar to you. And because I've used the words primary and secondary, you're probably thinking along the lines of, well, the primary follicle contains a primary oocyte and the secondary follicle contains secondary oocyte. But I have to tell you the stages of each are named very independent from one another. Let me explain what I mean. So down here I have a primary follicle that most likely does contain a primary oocyte. But then once a secondary follicle forms, it doesn't necessarily mean the oocyte has developed any further. So it probably still contains a primary oocyte as well. Once you get to the stage of a tertiary follicle, the oocyte inside could be, depending on how late the follicle, what day we're at here, the oocyte inside could either be a primary oocyte or a secondary oocyte. So just by looking at the follicles, you cannot tell what stage the oocyte is in. That is the take home message. So let's review what we do know about oogenesis so far or oocyte formation and maturation. We know that there are um, germline cells in the ovary that can give rise to oocytes. These are called oogonia. They're diploid, so 2N. Homologous chromosomes are present. These oogonia throughout fetal development multiply by mitosis and you get your 7 million or whatever and then eventually by birth it's only 2 million but uh, they will transform into primary oocytes. They just change what genes they're expressing. They're still diploid cells and we call them primary oocytes. So that's basically what's present at birth. During infancy and childhood, those primary oocytes are basically stalled in the first meiotic division very, very early. So before birth, the primary oocytes begin meiosis I, and then shortly after birth, they're stalled in infancy. And they remain stalled in late prophase one throughout childhood. So you have all these primary oocytes that are diploid, most likely sitting in primordial follicles. But at puberty and throughout adulthood each month, a single primary oocyte will complete meiosis one, and that better be in a dominant follicle. And the dominant follicle is going to make the most estrogen. So it's most likely that this is the oocyte that's going to mature. So the primary oocyte in the dominant follicle will complete meiosis one and start meiosis two. So the product of meiosis one is a secondary oocyte. That secondary oocyte will begin meiosis two, but it won't finish. It'll stall in metaphase two. That's what's ovulated, is a secondary oocyte is released. 
and it's gone through pro phase two and now it's in meta phase two. Once it's released, it goes into the uterine tube. If a sperm is around and fertilization occurs, then this secondary oocyte will finally complete meiosis two. And when it does so, it produces a mature ovum as well as polar bodies before the zygote forms. And the zygote forms when the two nuclei come together. So some of that verbiage might have been somewhat confusing to you. Let's relate what we already know first and then put the new information with it. This is what we've learned so far in lab. We said there were germline cells in the ovary that were diploid. And they were going to probably multiply, but most importantly, they were going to transform into these diploid primary oocytes. And those are the ones that would start meiosis. Now we know that these germline cells are really called ogonia, many of them. This one's one of them, so I wrote ogonium. So they're really called ogonia in females. An ogonium will transform into a primary oocyte. In fact, that happens to all of the ogonia. And then the primary oocyte before birth or shortly after, all the primary oocytes will have undergone meiosis one. And that means they will have produced, um, divided. DNA has been replicated, then they divide and they divide unequally. So each primary oocyte forms a secondary oocyte and a polar body. Both of these are haploid. Now those will begin meiosis II. What we learned in lab is they don't even start meiosis II until a sperm is around. But they actually do begin it. They just stop at metaphase II. So meiosis II is never complete. The only way you will get completion of the second meiotic division is if the sperm fertilizes that secondary oocyte. And then both the polar body that's yellow here and the secondary oocyte will divide. And what will result are two polar bodies from the original polar body and a polar body and an ovum from the secondary oocyte. All the products are haploid, but the only one that's functional is this ovum. So now let's look at the developmental stages um, in conjunction with what we've learned in lab. So what we know now is that before birth, all the oogonia transform into primary oocytes and all of them begin meiosis one but they stop. They are arrested in prophase one, and that's the state of things at birth. Then each month between puberty, the beginning of pu you know, puberty, the onset, the first uh, menstrual cycle is how we usually identify puberty, but there's other things all the way until menopause, every month, a group of primary oocytes start finishing meiosis one, but one primary oocyte in, is going to be located in one dominant follicle. And the oocyte that's in that dominant follicle will be the one that really completes meiosis one. And it will start meiosis two. And so a secondary oocyte has been formed from the primary oocyte, and that secondary oocyte starts meiosis II. Then it's arrested. It stops. And now what you have are um, a group of primary oocytes arrested in prophase I, and maybe more than one, but dominant follicles containing secondary oocytes. The secondary oocyte is always attached to this polar body as well. 
inside of a follicle. Then, if fertilization occurs within that month, this secondary oocyte could be fertilized and that would finish meiosis too. Then you would have a true ovum and three polar bodies. It's kind of weird. So I was mentioning previously that the words primary and secondary don't always match up with the follicle and the oocyte at exactly the same time. So here we've got a, a primordial follicle with a primary oocyte inside. Then we have a primary follicle with a primary oocyte, which the follicle changes, but the oocyte doesn't. So we get a secondary follicle containing a primary oocyte. And then the secondary follicle becomes an antral follicle. And at first, that's also containing a primary oocyte. But then the oocyte changes. And so now we have an antral or tertiary follicle containing a secondary oocyte. I don't expect you to remember this. The point is that the use of the words primary and secondary in oogenesis are not used for the same exact time point of follicle development. Okay, let's stop all that. So let's compare oogenesis with spermatogenesis. Let's do that much. Well, there's three things that come to mind, and that is that the two differ in terms of what products are produced by meiosis, how meiosis stages progress, like is there a stop point or does it just keep going all the way through, and then how are the gametes released? Because they're going to have to be released so they can join, male and female can join. So in males, the products of meiosis are all functional. So you get four functional end products, which are called spermatids. Now, they're not completely mature yet. They have to travel to the epididymis, and that fluid carries them to the epididymis. And then they undergo maturation called spermiogenesis. And spermiogenesis involves the formation of a flagellum and all that. In females, meiosis does produce four end products, but only one of them is a functional gamete, the ovum. The other three are polar bodies. Now, in terms of meiosis stages proceeding uninterrupted, that's true in males. There's no period of interruption. It continues, all the stages continue sequentially and continuously, like every day, all the time. In females, the stages of my, meiosis are arrested at two specific points. First, in prophase one, until a single oocyte is ovulated. And then, once ovulation has, uh, let's see, in prophase, until ovulation occurs each month. And then the second point is in metaphase two, and that is until fertilization occurs. So there's two points where it's halted. Gametes are slightly. They both involve fluid, but different kinds of movement. So in males, gametes are continuously produced in the seminiferous tubules, and those spermatids are released from the wall of the tubule because the Sertoli cells that surround them contract and the fluid production in the tubule kind of dislodges the spermatids and they just flow with the fluid out the seminiferous tubules into the epididymis and the rest of the duct system all due to being carried away by fluid. Now in females, there's a little bit of that that's true. But first of all, the release of gamete does not happen continuously every day all the time. A gamete is released monthly, one time. And what's released is a secondary oocyte that's 
dependent upon the development of the follicle. And eventually the follicle ruptures, and yeah, there's some 